Hello and welcome back to MLab 1231, Parasitology and Mycology. My name is Dustin Scott Brewster, and this is going to be the second of our two-part presentation on the introduction of parasitology. We left off last time talking about the collection, processing, and examination of stool specimens received in the clinical laboratory. And the types of stool specimens that one may receive include liquid specimens, semi-form specimens, or form specimens. And in the presence of a parasitic infection with a liquid specimen, what is most often seen are the trophozoites of intestinal protozoans or helminth eggs and larvae of the class Nematoda. The procedures you would perform on a liquid specimen could be permanent staining, which is best for the visualization of morphology, or a wet mount, which would allow for the detection of motility if present. <laughs> Semi-form specimens, what's most often seen, could be any stage. The procedures you would perform on this include direct examinations, concentration procedures, or acid fast or permanent staining. In form specimens, what's most often seen is the cyst stage of intestinal protozoans, as well as the helminth egg and larvae of class Nematoda. The procedures you would perform on a form specimen could be a direct mount, concentration procedures for lighter infections, as well as permanent staining, which tends to be equivocal to concentration procedures. And it's important in the presence of a form specimen to remove any mucus or stain, or mucus or blood and stain separately. The fixatives and preservatives used in the clinical laboratory include PVA formalin. PVA stands for polyvinyl alcohol. And the first vial of this two vial collection kit is 5 to 10 percent formalin, which is used to preserve helminth eggs and larvae, as well as protozoan cysts. It's used for direct wet mounts and is ideal for concentration procedures. In vial two, the polyvinyl alcohol fixative preserves trophozoites and cysts for permanent staining. The fixing agents used are mercury, zinc, and copper. And while mercury is the gold standard, zinc is the best alternative. This vial is best for fixative fixing and permanent staining. Also available is MIF or methylate iodine formalin, which is used for wet mounts and concentrations. However, you can't perform permanent staining on MIF. Next we have SAF or sodium acetate, <clears throat> sodium acetate acetic acid, which is used for concentration procedures. Staining with iron hematoxylin only. And trichrome stain tends to not stain as well using SAF. Next we have Schouden's fixative, which is used for fresh specimens containing mercury. And also available as 10% buffered formalin, which is used for concentration procedures only. When receiving a fresh specimen in the clinical laboratory, it's important to examine the specimen within 30 minutes to an hour. You want to store the specimen at room temperature, and if not allowed to examine within one hour, refrigerate the specimen. You never want to incubate the specimen if the time exceeds one hour. If the time does exceed one hour and you're not allowed to examine within that time period, you would want to use a preservation kit, which would hold the integrity of the specimen while processing the sample. When collecting the specimen for parasitology, it's important to collect in a clean container free of fecal debris on the outside of the container, and you don't want it to be contaminated with other debris or urine. The minimum number of samples should be a series of three, which would capture any irregular shedding patterns. The frequency of these collections should be performed on alternate days 
and never on the same day. It's important to inform the patient not to be on any laxatives as this may mask an infection and possibly damage the organism. Also important to remember is to date and time the collection container. One of the first things a technologist would perform when receiving a specimen for parasitology would be the gross examination. This would include grading the consistency of the sample, such as liquid, semi-form, or formed. If any worms are present, you would want to remove those worms and examine independently. If it's a larger worm, like Ascaris lumbricoides, that may be very obvious, or possibly a proglottid of a tapeworm, you would want to remove that and examine microscopically separately. Is there any blood or mucus present? Also, you would want to examine this by wet mount separately from the stool specimen. The wet mount itself is used for the detection of motility on fresh and unpreserved specimens. And the procedure for a wet mount includes taking a small amount of the sample, mixing it with a few drops of isotonic saline, then dropping on a clear slide. Then you would add a cover slip and view microscopically. You should ideally be able to read a newspaper through the smear, and if too thick, or you're not allowed to, if you're not able to read a newspaper, it could possibly be too thick. Alternatively to the isotonic saline, iodine may be substituted, which could possibly allow for the detection of any nuclear morphology of the organism. The advantages of a wet mount is that it reveals helminth eggs and larvae. It may possibly reveal the troph modal trophozoites or non-modal cysts. It could also reveal macrophages or leukocytes, which could indicate the presence of inflammation in the patient. Disadvantages of a wet mount is that Oil immersion can't be used, so you can't look at it on as high of a microscopic image. It may not provide adequate morphology. Organisms, if prepared too thick, could possibly be missed. It can't be used on PVA preserved specimens. And with a stained mount, a liquid specimen which more likely contains trophozoites, is used with buffered methylene blue, as iodine can be too harsh for trophozoites and often damages the morphology. In form specimens, they're more likely to contain only cysts, and popular stains include Dobell, Logal, and D'Antoni iodine stains. It's also important to not make the slide too thick and when performing examination to have a systematic pattern. So what is the purpose of a concentration procedure? Well, first off, it reduces the background of fecal debris, it increases the relative number of parasites, and it also preserves, <clears throat> preserves the morphology of the parasite. The two different types of concentration procedures used are first the flotation procedure, which floats parasites free of fecal debris by using a solution that has a specific gravity greater than the parasite and less than the background of the fecal matter. The advantages of a flotation procedure is that it provides a clean concentrate, the reagents have a long shelf life, and it provides adequate, morpho <clears throat> adequate morphology of the organism. The disadvantages is that the specific gravity must be checked frequently. Larger helminth eggs of class nematoda often won't float and must be examined before the organism settles. In addition to the flotation procedure, there is the sedimentation procedure. The sedimentation procedure concentrates diagnostic stages in the sediment. The use of ethyl acetate cleans the specimen by dissolving and floating fat. The formalin ethyl acetate procedure is the most commonly used procedure in parasitology. The reagents include 
5 to 10 percent formalin, which kills and preserves the parasite, and ethyl, <clears throat> ethyl acetate, which dissolves fat and floats artifacts. This is important to know. The advantages of the sedimentation procedure is that it allows for the recovery of all helminth eggs, larvae, and protozoan cysts. It's easy to perform, it has several stopping places, and can be read any time following the procedure. The disadvantages of the sedimentation or the ethyl acetate procedure is that ethyl acetate is flammable, the procedure is not as clean as the flotation method, and the specimen to reagent ratio must be monitored closely. Too much specimen can interfere with the efficiency of the cleansing and concentration procedure. The goal of permanent staining is aimed at trophozoite stages. The factors that could affect permanent staining could include the age of the specimen as organisms deteriorate over time, the consistency, fixation as the specimen must be mixed thoroughly with the specimen with the preservative. The smear and preparation, is it too thick or is it too thin? It has to have the right balance the right consistency, the right thickness. The reagents must be qualified by performing QC procedures based on your site, your facility. The iron hematoxylin procedure provides excellent morphology. However, it is time consuming and difficult to produce. Alternatively, the Wheatley's trichrome stain is rapid, easy to perform, and more reproducible. Other detection methods include immunoserological detection, which often come in test kits that test for the detection or the presence of an antigen antibody complex. For tests that measure for the presence of an antibody, they include enzyme immunoassay or EIA, complement fixation, latex agglutination, direct and indirect immunofluorescence, indirect hemagglutination, bentonite flocculation, and immunoblot. More new are molecular methods which detect nucleic acid of the organism. This works by isolating the DNA or RNA of the organism then amplifying that nucleic acid by a, a procedure called PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. You would then amplify, or that amplified DNA would then be detected using an endpoint PCR procedure or a real-time PCR procedure. On the right here, we have gel electrophoresis, which is a type of endpoint detection method. Other testing methods include the estimation of a worm burden of the host. This must be preserved or performed on unpreserved specimens as the preservatives will dilute the specimen and interfere with the count. The count are measured in eggs per gram of feces. Also available is in vitro cultivation of parasite. It's very difficult to perform, and therefore not many labs do this anymore. It's primarily used for blood and tissue protozoa. And also available are the culture of intestinal protozoa. However, not generally done due to the time and sensitivity of the test. Also available, but again not routinely performed, is animal inoculation or in vivo inoculation. This is not routinely done. It's very expensive, time-consuming, and lacks sensitivity. It's used primarily for the isolation of blood and tissue protozoans or trypanosomes. This is known as xenodiagnosis, which is considered a special case of animal inoculation. The term was originally used and applied to the diagnosis of Chagas disease after replacing unaffected reduviate bugs 
as a patient suspected of having Chagas and allowing them to feed the bugs and then they were examined for different developmental stages of the parasite. What is commonly performed is known as the cellophane tape preparation. This is used for the detection of enterobius vermicularis. The procedure must be done early in the morning and before the patient bathes or has their first bowel movement. The procedure includes making an impression with a sticky paddle or a clear cellophane tape around the anal area and then examined microscopically for the presence of eggs. In the image here, we have the presence of anaerobius vermicularis eggs detected using a cellophane tape preparation. Also available for the detection of parasites are urogenital specimens. This is tested on exudates and examined on wet mounts. Samples can include vaginal, urethral, or prostate specimens. And the goal here is to look for the motility and yeast from a patient. And this is most often done to detect the presence of Trichomonas vaginalis. Also available or allowed to detect is the presence of Schistosoma hematobium. Schistosoma hematobium eggs inhabit the vessels around the urinary bladder then pop into the bladder as a result of expansion and contraction of the bladder. And this is also done in conjunction with the aid of the terminal spine of the organism. In the image on the right here, if this was a live image looking at a wet mount of a urogenital sample, this is Trichomonas vaginalis. And if this was a live image, you would be able to see the jerky motility of the organism microscopically. Other specimen types include aspirates and biopsies. These aspirates can include duodenal contents, which can detect the presence of Giardia lamblia or Strongyloides stercoralis. Additionally, we have the intero test, which includes a capsule containing a freewheeling piece of yarn, which would sample duodenal contents. Also available is the sigmoidoscopy tissue biopsy, as well as abscess aspirates. Other biopsies include intestinal or bladder mucosa, which would allow for the direct microscopic examine, uh, examination of other schistosoma species. In the bottom right image here, we have a duodenal biopsy indicating the presence of schistosoma mansoni, which is seen here by the schistosoma mansoni's lateral spine present. We'll get into that later in treatment toads. For blood samples collected in the clinical lab, uh, smears can be performed. Finger, heel, or earlobe sticks are the preferred for thick and thin smears. EDTA samples are best if made within one hour. Sodium citrate specimens are used for large amounts of blood, and clot tubes or SST serum separator tubes are used for serological testing, such as uh, for the use of immunoserological detection of the antigen antibody complex we talked about uh, previously. With a blood sample, you may also use a wet mount or perform a wet mount, which would allow for the screening of motility seen in trypanosomes or filaria. For permanent staining, the two most common stains are the right stain or the Giemsa stain. The right stain is alcohol-based and doesn't allow for the adjustment of the pH. The Giemsa stain, however, is water-based, which allows you to adjust the pH and is the preferred stain for the detection of malaria. When performing permanent staining, thick blood films and thin blood films are usually performed together. And with the thick blood film, 
This is the procedure used for the detection of malaria and trypanosomes. The preparation includes adding three to four drops of blood and stirring to the size of a dime, and then dehemoglobinized in buffered water with right stain. This isn't necessary. With right stain and with Gems stain, this isn't necessary. The advantages is that it concentrates the blood and would pick up a lighter infection. However, the infected red blood cell is lost from the hemoglobination process, and the specimen must also dry overnight, so it tends to be a little more time consuming. The thin blood film, which is done with the thick blood film, also detects malaria and trypanosomes. The preparation is the same as a CBC wedge method. The advantages of the thin blood film is that it allows for the observation of infected red blood cells and allows for better organism morphology. The disadvantage is that it must be examined for 30 minutes or at least 100 fields, which tend to be more time consuming, and lighter infections may be missed as thin blood films are concentrated. That's going to conclude the second part of the intro to parasitology presentation, and we will pick this back up with our next unit, Unit 2, Class Nematoda.